when we look at Mark's gospel, and Mark was probably the first gospel to be written. And what we know from somebody who uh, wrote down that um, Peter, the apostle Peter, told Mark what had happened, because Mark wasn't a, a, an initial disciple of Jesus. Mark was too young when Jesus was um, actually living on earth. So Peter told Mark what had happened when he um, was a disciple of Jesus up until uh, after Jesus' death and resurrection. And Peter was one of the disciples. So what we've got in the Gospel of Mark is an account of Peter's life and dealings and so on. It's mainly about Jesus, but it's about Peter's interaction with Jesus as well. So the adults this morning are going to be looking at Peter because Peter didn't obey the rules of making a good CV. He was prepared to admit he did some silly things in terms of his relationship with Jesus. He let Jesus down on lots of occasions. So it wasn't a good CV, but it was honest in terms of how he lived and how he related to Jesus. So that's what we're going to look at. Peter's life, as recorded in Mark, um, and um, and how that worked out, and Jesus' ability to forgive Peter. Um, someone early in the second century, uh, called uh, Papias, um, wrote that Peter told Mark what had happened, and Mark wrote it down. So we've got the gospel, because Peter was prepared to share with Mark. Um, and that's what we've been looking at in the evening. So some of what I'm going to say now, we've already covered in the evening. So apologies to the evening folk who come if it's a repetition. I want to look at aspects of Peter's life, um, mainly from Mark, but a little bit from Acts as well, and one episode from John. Um, so we're going to look at it together. Um, so if you have particular things you'd like to say, then put your hand up. We'll share together. And I'm going to ask you some questions as well. So you're not going to sit passively and close your, give your eyes a rest this morning. You're going to uh, try and answer my obscure questions, um, and, and then um, we'll learn together. So it's an overview of Peter and Peter's life, it's a bit like um, looking at Peter's CV. Okay. Um, how many of you remember what CV stands for? How many? If I, if I actually um, said to somebody in the congregation, um, what CV? Would you, would you know it? Okay, good. Okay. I, I won't embarrass you by asking. Um, most of the Bible passages we're going to look at this morning will be familiar to you. So it's not as if we're, we're going through um, difficult to understand or strange passages. But it is an attempt to look at the whole of Peter's life and try to understand what relevance it has to us today. Okay, so Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Mark is the third, um, sorry, second gospel. Um, and we'll start at chapter one. Um, so looking at chapter one of Mark. So New Testament, um, Mark's gospel, and um, looking at, first of all, chapter one looking at verses 16 to 18, first of all. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. 
At once, they left their nets and followed him. Okay, decisive action on Peter's part. Um, Jesus says, come and follow me. And at once, they um, left their nets and followed Jesus. So what do we learn uh, about Peter from that? He was a decisive person. He made up his mind and he did it. Um, and quick decisions. And he, well, the other thing we learned from that is, is what? what, what um, state the obvious. What, what was he? A fisherman, yeah. So a, a lot of the questions will be fairly obvious. So don't be afraid of shouting out an answer to obvious questions. So he was a fisherman. Um, he, throwing his nets into the lake and um, Jesus calling him to follow him. Still in chapter um, 1, uh, verses 29 to 31, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Okay, so what do we learn about Peter in that? He was married, thank you. <laughs> um, he was married. He, you don't have a mother-in-law unless you're married. Um, so um, he was married. We don't know whether he had any children. We don't know a lot about what would normally be in a CV. But we know he was married and Jesus healed his mother-in-law. Um, verses 35 to 37, in, um, still in chapter 1. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone's looking for you. Jesus replied, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. So Simon and his companions, what's the use of having a teacher that you want to follow if he goes off? and <laughs> You lose him. <laughs> so he was off looking for Jesus and found Jesus um, praying. So, not only did Jesus teach his disciples, he showed them the importance of a life demonstrating what he was teaching. So, prayer was important to Jesus. Okay, chapter 3, verses 13 to 16, still going through Peter's CV. Um, chapter 3, verse 13 to 16. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to them, to them whom he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach, have authority to drive out demons. These are the 12 he appointed. Simon, to whom he named gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, to, he, to whom he gave the name Bonages, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So Simon was an important person in Jesus' followers. He was the first in the list of 12 apostles. So an important leader in the, um, the band of 12. So summary thus far, Peter was decisive, at once left the nets. A fisherman, he was married, he was learning from Jesus by what he did, what Jesus did, as well as what he said. 
And Peter was one of the leaders in the bunch of 12 disciples immediately um, closest to Jesus. So, okay, so that's the first bit of Peter's CV. Um, go on now to look at some other parts of Peter's CV. The next little bit that I want to take out, uh, we haven't got time to look at all the bits where Peter's mentioned, but a little bit in the middle that, that we've mentioned on the uh, Sunday evening as well. So chapter 8, So turn on to chapter 8 of Mark, and we look at verse 27 to 29. So chapter 8, verses 27 to 29. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him, at least not at that stage. They were going to tell lots of others about him later on. Peter answered, you are the Christ. Well done, Peter. <laughs> fantastic insight. Jesus was pleased with Peter. Peter had come to the conclusion Jesus was the Christ. So lots of positive feedback there. And then immediately afterwards, Jesus predicts his death. He then began, verse 31, he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. No way, Lord! No way can this happen to you. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. So Peter not doing so well. So if you wanted, if you were drawing up your own CV, you wouldn't put that particular thing in your CV. Peter's misunderstanding of the nature of Jesus as Messiah. And then in chapter 9, verse 30, again, um, chapter 9, um, verse 30 to 32, say this, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus didn't want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. So again, Jesus teaching that he was going to suffer and die. And then immediately following that, Mark writes, they came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet, because on the way, they had argued about who was the greatest. What a thing to be arguing about when Jesus has just been teaching them that he'd got to suffer and die. If I'd have been Jesus, I'd have said, Lord, 
give me another 12, please. Peter would have been part of that argument, I'm sure. Who is the greatest? And then in chapter 10, 32 to 34, they were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. And then Mark immediately writes this. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Status. They were arguing about status. And were the other disciples hopping mad at that? They wanted the two most important places in the kingdom of God. They wanted one on Jesus' right, one on Jesus' left. And verse 41 of chapter 10 says, When the ten heard this, so Peter would be in amongst the ten because they were hopping mad at James and John. Peter, uh, Mark didn't actually put hopping mad in it, but that's what the, I'm sure was behind that. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Every time Jesus wanted to teach his disciples about his coming death. The disciples came up with something pretty disastrous in terms of their understanding of Jesus' mission. So the first one, Peter saying, no, Lord, no, you, you're not going to suffer and die. You're the Messiah. That can't happen to you. The second one was them arguing who was going to be the greatest amongst the apostles. The third one was James and John and the rest of the disciples being really mad at them, indignant, because they wanted a thing above the rest of them, wanted a status thing. None of the disciples in this section starred in any way. None of them would have wanted to include any of that stuff on their CV. But you know what? Peter was prepared to share that with Mark. And Mark wrote it down. And we wouldn't have known about that had Peter not been prepared to be honest and tell Mark about where he'd failed, as well as where he succeeded. And then there's a section in Mark's Gospel leading up to the trials and crucifixion of Jesus. And there are times when Peter let Jesus down big time. If we look at Mark 14, and verses 32 to 34. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him. And he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. He said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going on a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, 
everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus goes away, prays some more, comes back, and the disciples fall asleep again. He does a third time, comes back, finds them asleep again. They were dead tired. And then Jesus was arrested. But the disciples actually not being there to support Jesus in Jesus' hour of greatest need. Falling asleep on the job. And then Peter actually saying he was never going to um, never going to deny Jesus. Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. So it wasn't just Peter, it was all the others as well. That was verse 31. Denying Jesus after boasting about it, that he would never do so. So if we look at um, verse 66 to 72, let me read that to you. It's a, a familiar passage, I'm sure, to you. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you're one of them. You're a Galilean. Implication, I can tell by your accent. You're a northerner. He began to call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the cock crow crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. You know, that was as significant a sin as Judas's sin. But Judas didn't come back to Jesus and say sorry. Peter was prepared to do that. Jesus was prepared to forgive him. But again, you don't put that in your CV if you want to get the job. <laughs> I want to just look over to John's Gospel because there's just a little thing that I picked up from one of the commentaries. If we look at Jesus, um, Peter uh, standing by the fire warming himself, um, John puts it this way. Um, it was cold and the servants and officials stood round a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them warming himself. So John's account of Peter standing 
warming himself by the fire. And apparently the word, I don't know any Greek, so this is from the commentary, so I'm just trying to make myself look as if I do know some Greek. I don't. Um, the, the commentary says the Greek word there was charcoal. The, the fire was charcoal. And it's an unusual word, apparently. It only occurs twice in the New, New Testament. Once was here with Peter warming himself with the charcoal fire. And the other time? Anybody want to guess where the other time a charcoal fire is mentioned? Was when post-resurrection met the disciples, was cooking fish on the beach when the disciples were fishing. Jesus, John was reminding us that the other time with a charcoal fire was when Peter was denying Jesus. Peter jumps out of the boat, runs to meet Jesus, and what greets him? A charcoal fire on the beach. Now, if that ain't a reminder <laughs> of Peter's denial of Jesus, I don't know what is. But it was a reminder that Jesus was prepared to forgive him. And at the empty tomb, the angel said, go tell his disciples and Peter. Go tell his disciples and Peter. Peter needing Jesus' forgiveness, but God providing signs that give Peter encouragement to come back to Jesus to ask forgiveness. And then something amazing happened. Peter, rather than denying, falling asleep, all the other things he shouldn't have included on his CV. Acts chapter 2, verse 14 to 17 says this, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. So Acts chapter 2, read, I started to read it, verse 14. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. And verse 40 to 41 says this. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Mig, you've got to arrange for 3,000 to be changing at the back. It was lovely to see those who were baptized last week. But just imagine this. 3,000. And who was preaching? Peter. Of course it was Peter. And what had happened? The Holy Spirit had been given. He was empowered to do that. The old Peter who had let Jesus down so many times had become filled with the Spirit of God. Acts 3, verse 6, and then verses 11 to 12 says this. Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. They were passing, they were going into the temple, and the man was sat there begging. 
silver and gold have I none. What I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Walk. Then when the beggar held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Men of Israel, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we have made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he though he had decided, Pilate had decided to let him go. Boldness, a deep understanding through the Holy Spirit given to him of what Jesus did. Peter, healing. And many, we could go through the rest of the book of Acts looking at Peter's repentant life. Peter being filled by the Holy Spirit. The man who initially didn't deliver the things he'd promised now was empowered by the Holy Spirit to be the kind of leader Jesus longed for him to be. A CV which was worthy of his master because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let me just conclude by reading that passage um, when Jesus communicated with Peter after breakfast on the beach. I was in, uh, in the chapel yesterday morning when they were putting up the scaffolding and uh, the ladies were having their breakfast. So um, it, it, it wasn't meeting with Jesus on the beach, but it was meeting in the back room and, and Gabby kindly provided me with a lovely breakfast. So uh, it, it had its uh, uh, compensation uh, uh, supervising the scaffolding. Um, but what... Uh, I want to read is John 21 verses 15 to 19. John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things, so you know I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Three times Peter had denied Jesus. Three times Jesus said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Follow me. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. There's one other passage from Acts. Acts chapter 4, as I say, we could go on looking in Acts, but this seemed to sum up where Peter was. Acts chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. They were taken before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish rulers um, at that time, uh, temple, and um, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. And they took note. What did they took note of? They took note that these men had been with Jesus. They took note 
that these men had been with Jesus. Let me read it again. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. What a lovely way to end a CV. An ordinary, unschooled person. He probably couldn't read or write. You didn't need to read or write to be a fisherman in those days. I know quite a few members of the congregation are teachers or involved in teaching in some way. But these were unschooled men. They had been with Jesus. A man who had a mother-in-law. I have no idea what Peter's relationship with his mother-in-law was. It was as good or not. An ordinary person who, when filled with the Spirit of God, preached at Pentecost. Christians were saved. Gation of ordinary people. But when God equips us, we can be the kind of people that Jesus would have us be. And that's partly what we've been learning on the Friday evenings. Missionary Jesus, wanting to share our faith with others. Peter was honest about his failings as well as his strengths. Are we honest in our prayer to Jesus? Are we prepared to repent when we know we've sinned? Are we prepared for our CV? You know, I've been inevitably to lots of funerals at Dry Lane. I've taken some funerals, um, especially in COVID when Pastor Frank had left. I had to do some of the funerals then, funerals when there was only allowed six people at the, uh, the crematorium or, or at the chapel uh, for burials. You know, in almost all funerals, you have like a CV, a eulogy, saying this and that about the person who has died. But there's hardly ever mention of, he wasn't very good at that, he, he didn't do that well, or he, he messed up on the other. It's usually um, CVs that are acknowledging the good points. Are we prepared to be more like Peter in admitting that we're not very good at some things, but by the power of the Spirit, being prepared to walk with Jesus?